Today we talk to Robin from Atelier One, a watch brand with a distinct design philosophy. They are on a mission to explore Chinese craftsmanship and aim to make it accessible to all of us. Now please enjoy this insightful and eye-opening interview with Robin himself. Quand tu veux, tu es, tu es ok Ouais, ouais. bien sûr, ouais. quand tu veux. Robin, great to see you. Before we begin, uh, what's on your wrist today? Yeah, for sure. I mean, great seeing you, Yann, as well. Uh, so today on my wrist, I have the prototype of our upcoming series named Perception. And here you have the, the gray the gray dial. Um, what's so special about this watch is that the dial is handmade guilloche by China's only guilloche master craftsman. And he needs more than eight hours to do just one dial. Um, so yeah, quite, quite something unique, otherwise very thin watch, it's made of 904L steel, so also quite, quite unique and uh, yeah, that's, that's what I have on, on my wrist today. Nice, nice, nice. Um, uh, for people watching this that do not know you, can you tell a little bit the story of uh, Atelier Wen? Yeah, of course. So I, I, I guess I'll start with, with my own story because it's kind of related with how Atelier Wen was born. Um, so I'm, I'm French uh, and I started collecting watches when I was 14. So how it started is that for my 14th birthday, my parents gave me a, a watch and it was a quartz Seiko chronograph. And it kind of triggered something in my mind, like suddenly I became so interested in it. And you know, I was doing online research and so on. And very, very quickly, what I wanted was an automatic watch because Uh, reading forums online, you know, you tend to believe that the only real watches are, are automatic watches. But uh, at 14, of course, I, I did not have the, the money to buy an automatic watch. And my parents saw it was rather foolish to give me like three or four hundred euros to buy like an entry level Tissot or Hamilton. So I couldn't get those and um, therefore I did more research and that's how I discovered uh, mechanical Chinese watches. And uh, it was still a time where like for roughly a hundred bucks you could get a really high quality ones. Was this and, like the, the seagulls of the time? Yeah, or? like yeah. The, the, the seagull, like you know the entry level automatic seagulls, they were around a hundred bucks. And back then I was quite lucky because with my parents we would often go to China. So the next summer we went to, to Shanghai and I bought my very first seagull with my own pocket money and it was like a nice automatic watch and well you know I saw it was really really cool and then as time went by I got another one another one another one and I kind of started building a collection and then I started buying vintage and when I bought vintage I started writing about it online and it was still a time where people knew kind of very little a little about those like mechanical Chinese watches so a lot of people were reading what I was writing and one summer actually uh, I won a scholarship to go study in a summer school in Beijing uh, so I was spending the summer there And actually one morning, uh, like the last night I went out, so I was a bit hangover. So I canceled all my meetings because I couldn't wake up on time. And I went to a shop and in this shop, I met like a guy I was writing with on the online forums, a guy I was talking about with Chinese watches. And it turns out it was a pure, pure coincidence. And this guy was like a Canadian guy, so not Chinese at all. He was just like doing holiday in Beijing. But it turns out this guy was like super well connected in the industry. So he put me in touch with his friends who were like responsible for overseeing the, the industry at a national level. Uh, his friends were also like CEOs of big brands, big manufacturers. And I got along quite well with, with those people. And the next year, I went again in Beijing this year for a whole year of uh, abroad studies. I went to, to Peking University and uh, I basically spent the year with those people. And during that year, those people, they just took me to all the factories, all the watchmakers, all the craftsman and what I saw when I was there is that actually there's so much quality so much talent so much passion so much like dedication you know you, you would meet people actually who've been doing this job for decades or people who live and breathe this job and who are really yeah that there's only this in their mind but then when I would go back to the UK or, or to France I would tell people about like made in China about all those great people I met and you know they would look at me they would laugh at me and they would tell me like hey listen like Robin made in China is shit and it's like sweatshops and it's like young kids working in factories and you know it couldn't be more wrong so 
I don't know, it kind of triggered something in my mind and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna make a brand which is like super high quality, which is like super interesting in terms of design to show those people that actually made in China can be really cool, can be really high quality, can be really interesting. Um, so that, that's kind of like the initial assumption. And then uh, I met my business partner. So my business partner is a guy named Wilfried. Uh, he was also studying with me in the UK at Warwick University, but unlike me, he was born in Hong Kong. He spent all his childhood till teenage years in Hong Kong. I mean, he speaks fluent Chinese, he was born and raised there and um, this guy was so much into entrepreneurship so he kind of like saw my passion for watches he kind of saw my disappointment uh, with this kind of gap in terms of perceptions in terms of like a reputation and he was like you know what let's do a business together and um, and that's how that's how we started uh, basically we were like so with those watches we're gonna explore both Chinese culture and craftsmanship and therefore through the medium of watches show people all over the world that can be really cool and, and just let them appreciate it, like let them enjoy it, let them see that it's nice and yeah, have a, uh, have a nice size with, with those. So yeah, basically that's how we started at 31. How it went afterwards, so um, in our last year of uni, which was in 2017, we kind of like started conceptually, conceptualizing sorry, the, the whole thing. And then we both went to masters, for, for masters, he went to do masters in Tsinghua in Beijing, I went to do masters in London Business School. And during this year, we hired some designers, we made designs, we made protos, and, and the timing actually was really good because by the time we both graduated, we had prototypes ready. Oh, okay. So then we were able to like, just like uh, two months after launch the Kickstarter. Cause you know, I mean, when you finish school, you kind of, kind of have this pressure to look for a job. And my parents were like, no, you, you got to find a job. And uh, all my friends were going into consulting, eye banking. So there, there's kind of like an opportunity cost. You know, you're saying no to all those things. You kind of need to be sure of yourself, like, because you're forfeiting something large. But fortunately for us, the timing was good because the protos were there and the risk was just two months. You know, if the, if the Kickstarter had failed, I would have just waited two months and then I would have applied to those jobs my, my friends were doing. And, and the, the kick, sorry to interrupt, the Kickstarter was the Porcelain Dial, right? Yeah, yeah, was, yeah uh, it yes, was the yes, first yes, series, yeah. so it was called Porcelain Odyssey. At the beginning was two models, one white dial, which was the How, one blue dial, which was called G. And um, the Kickstarter went well, we did around like 100,000 USD, which was really good, and for us it was like marvelous. Uh, and then basically we both moved to Hong Kong and we, we just were working full time on, on developing the brand. Yeah, yeah. At some point we tried to launch in mainland China, uh, unfortunately it didn't go as well as we, we hoped it would be. Um, there were a few reasons for that, I think the market was not yet mature enough to accept those kind of products and also there's a cost of marketing in China which is much higher in mainland China which is much higher uh, in the sense that um, let's say that the cost of visibility is higher but the conversion rates are lower so basically you need a lot more visibility and at the same time you're gonna pay a lot more for this visibility so you need to have huge budgets which we did not have um, likewise uh, physical retail is still extremely important in China and demand tend to be quite spread it out. It's not like Belgium, France or the UK where you have two cities where the bulk of the demand is. Like, you know, in France you have Paris and if you just focus on Paris, you are addressing 80% of the market. In China, you have all the tier one and tier two cities, which are very important and that's like 20 cities. So if you really want to do retail well, you need to be in like 20 different locations and that's extremely capex intensive. So for those reasons, we, we did not do it that well there and uh, therefore we had to sort of like slow down things with the brand. We both found jobs, but we were still like working on it. And very slowly we were working on our new series. And uh, well, finally there we are. It's, it's now ready. It's been a really long time, like more than two years. And uh, yeah, we're super happy to, to be launching it because it's it's quite quite interesting. It's quite a step above as well. Yeah, it looks and honestly before, it looks yeah. uh, fantastic. Uh, Thank you very, uh, very well done. And I mean, you touched upon it, right? But uh, I think with Atelier Wen, the thing that is very clear is like the proudly made in China, yeah, right? Yeah, Whereas yeah. other brands certainly also make in China, but will not advertise it as such. And, and uh, wait, one thing I think like more than made in China, it's also like designed in China because I see right. there are some brands like they sort of like disclose the fact that they are made in China 
but then the, the product have, let's say, like a Swiss identity, a German identity, a French identity. For ourselves, we, because you know, when, when you tell people it's, it's made in China and they laugh at you, for them, it's like there's two issues. There's one issue which is of quality, but there's one issue is that they believe like all Chinese products are copycats. So for us, it was very important to show that it can be very creative and like, purely Chinese in the identity. Uh, so it's both like proudly made in China, but it's also like proudly conceptualized in, in China. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what we want to do. Like a 100% Chinese product on all ends of the, of the spectrum. Yeah, of course. So uh, Atelier One is a boutique, boutique independent watch brand, a Franco-Chinese one, because even though I mean, the initial impetus was to explore Chinese culture, but then we realized we're like two French guys and two Chinese designers. So we can't claim to be 100% Chinese. So it's like French and Chinese. We're exploring like China, but like there's still a strong French aspect to this. Uh, but basically what's the USP of Atelier One is that we're exploring Chinese culture and craftsmanships and trying to make it like accessible to everyone around the world.